Kavita Das has served as Marketing and Communications Director for Race Forward, where she helped support the Shattered Families Report. Her work has appeared in Guernica, The Rumpus, The Atlantic, The Aerogram, and AAWW's The Margins. So can I get a round of applause, please? Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight. Um, I think this is an amazing way to close out International Women's Day, don't you think? Um, so, although I do, I wish um, we were here to talking about historical fiction or dystopian sci-fi, but in fact, you know, today's topic, families versus migration, is ripped from the headlines. Um, so these are really gripping, crucial, heartbreaking issues. Um, and one of the best ways that we can deal with this is by uh, exploring it through the prism of research, journalism, fiction, um, and documentary films, whatever, what have you. Um, I actually just wanted to get another show of hands. How many people here uh, are immigrants? And how many are the children of immigrants? Great, so we're one big family. Excellent. Um, well, welcome tonight. We really appreciate having you here. It's going to be a, a stellar program. Um, we have uh, amazing speakers. Um, I do need to make one uh, other announcement that's ripped from the headlines. One of our speakers, Paula Mendoza, um, will not be joining us tonight because she is the artistic uh, director of the Women's March. And, um, and in her role, she was actually, uh, it appears she was arrested for civil disobedience as part of t today's march. So we uh, will really miss her um, and her uh, distinct perspective, uh, given that she's an author, a filmmaker, um, you know, and given her role in the women's, Crucial Women's March. But um, we are with her in solidarity, and you can show your solidarity by supporting the march and by buying her book and watching her film that she uh, co-directed uh, and starred in um, called Entre Nos from 2009. It won awards at the Tribeca Film Festival. So we're going to charge ahead. So I'm going to introduce... Uh, the speakers we have with us. Um, Shanti Shakaran is the author of the novel Lucky Boy, copies available at the back, uh, which was released just earlier this year to rave reviews. Shanti teaches creative writing at the California College of the Arts and is a member of the Portuguese Artist Colony and the San Francisco Writers Grotto. Her work has appeared in Best New American Voices and Canteen and online at Ziziva, I hope I'm saying that right, um, and Mother Magazine. Her first novel, The Prayer Room, was published by McAdam Cage. Uh, she's a California native, and she lives in Berkeley with her son and two children. With her, sorry, with her husband and two children. I was like, I knew that didn't sound right. No judgments. And we also have with us Rinku Shen, who is the executive director of Race Forward, the Center for Racial Justice Innovation and the publisher of Color Lines, an award-winning racial justice news site. Rinku co-authored The Accidental American, Immigration and Citizenship in the Age of Globalization, published in 2008, also for sale at the back. Story of a Moroccan-born waiter who had, who, who had worked at the World Trade Center during 9-11 and found himself the victim of hate crimes in the post-9-11 era. She is also the author of Stir It Up, Lessons in Community Organizing and Advocacy, published in 2003, a handbook for budding activists. Rinku is the co-chair of the Schott Foundation for Public Education and sits on the boards of Hedgebrook and Working America. She received a BA in Women's Studies from Brown University and an MS in Journalism at Columbia University. A native of India, Rinku grew up in northeastern factory towns and learned to speak English in a two-room schoolhouse. She's also my ex-boss lady. Um, so with that introduction, uh, Rinku and I are going to have a conversation about shattered families, and then we'll um, and then we'll have a reading by Shanti from Lucky Boy. So you're really in for a treat. Ha <laughs> 
<laughs> Excellent. Um, so I thought that it would be great for us to ground this discussion in the Shattered Families report. Um, it was a really groundbreaking, comprehensive report um, and really prescient, you know, given uh, the situation right now. So um, it was released in November 2011. Um, and it examined the impact of the intersection of the U.S. immigration system and child protective services system on undocumented fam immigrant families. Um, the Shattered Families Report, along with follow-up reporting by Color Lines, delved deeply into all the complex ways that thousands of immigrant families are impacted. But I wondered if you can uh, first talk about the impetus for the report, because now it seems so obvious but you know, this was 2011, and we had a Democratic president then. Um, so, what? How did this come about? So, uh, oh yes, I'm supposed to talk into the mic. Um, in 2003 to like 2005, I was in journalism school at Columbia, and in my magazine writing class, I was looking for stories to produce. And a friend of mine who is a social worker introduced me to three young girls, the oldest was maybe 11 and the youngest was five, whose mother had just finished serving a prison term on a drug conviction. The mother was coming out of prison and the girls and sh the mother were excitedly uh, awaiting being reunified. The kids had been in foster care during the prison term, but when mom came out, they discovered that she was going to be deported um, as a result of her um, conviction. So she did her time and then would also be deported. And when I met these girls, they were, um, their, their vision of their future and their family life with their mom had just shifted and they were depressed is the only real word I have for that. So I heard that one story and I thought if this is happening one time in New York, which is a state with progressive immigration practices and policies, then it must be happening elsewhere. And these are kids who are in foster care because their mother is going to be deported. So, um, so that was in 2004. We did not release the story until 2011. So for five years, um, I chased it. We did little things here and there. Like we found a family who, uh, with a Jamaican father who um, essentially self-deported because he was going to get deported. Um, we had a few meetings of people in, who worked on immigration. But in the early years, Everybody I asked about it would say, that doesn't happen to us. And there was a real racial component to that. So Latino immigrants would kind of say it like, only black people get their kids taken by child welfare, basically. Uh, I'm being really crass about how I'm um, saying this now. But many, many people said initially, it's not an issue. That doesn't happen to our families. No, 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 no. And we just stuck with it until finally uh, we were able to raise enough money to do a proper investigation. And um, that's, that's how it came. And it was partly, I think, I think if I was not the eldest child of immigrants, like if I wasn't an eldest immigrant child, I don't know that the initial family that I met um, would have had an effect on me. But they did, even though I didn't end up writing that story for my magazine class. I didn't, I didn't relate to those girls again. It wasn't the story that ended up happening then. But I just felt, I felt so strongly that um, criminal deportation on top of a prison sentence is double jeopardy. And that if you take kids away from parents who are uh, otherwise loving and not neglectful, then it's abduction. Like there's no other real word for it. If the if the family has issues and you take the kids, then you're like protecting the kids, and it's child welfare or child protection. But if there's not that kind of abuse or neglect in the family, then you're just taking kids and like basically making them available for Americans to adopt. Um, so that was the impetus, and that was what it took to get to the story actually done. 
actually didn't know that. So that's actually really amazing to hear the backstory and how it evolved uh, with the times. Um, I just thought that, you know, if you can talk about some of the key findings that came out of the report, there were uh, a few groundbreaking findings because this was like the first time this data was aggregated. This is the first time it was put together. It took a lot of, you know, investigation yeah. work. So we released the report in November 2011, and our big finding, which people are still citing now, is that at that moment in time, a very, very conservative estimate was that 5,000 children across the country were in foster care really only because their parents had been deported. That the deportation, whatever the reason was for uh, child welfare getting involved in the first place, those reasons varied. Whatever the initial um, reason was, uh, the reason for kids remaining in foster care was that their parents had been deported. And uh, so that 5,000 kid figure was major. And then a lot of, so at Race Forward, what we do is help people understand um, how racism happens, basically. How does racial bias actually operate? and help them understand the mechanisms, the actual rules, whether written or unwritten, the actual behaviors of individuals that amounts to discrimination. So one of the big things we try to teach people is how to understand structural racism as the interaction of multiple institutions. And in this case, we had local law enforcement immigration enforcement, and child welfare. So it's kind of a perfect case study. You could see like when these three institutions um, collide in a family's life, this is the result. Um, so 5,000 kids, the actual, there, we did a flow chart um, that was the anatomy of a case. So you could see like where are the decision points, where are the written policies messed up, um, and, and I think it helps people understand this particular problem, but also to understand structural racism in general. Yeah, definitely. Um, so in addition to uncovering key statistics like that fact that more than 5,000 children in the foster care system had parents who were either being deported or detained, and illustrating how these families were being failed by not one, but two problematic systems, uh, Color Lines did follow up reporting on the personal toll, examining individuals and families. Um, how did the Shattern Families Report and Color Line Stories work together to illuminate these injustices? Um, so my training is as an organizer and as a journalist. It's not as a service provider or as an advocate of individuals. But one of the most um, gratifying things about doing this project over the years that we were chasing it, is that I, I know that we helped some families actually stay together. We enabled some kids to actually not lose their parents and some parents to actually not lose legal um, ties to their kids. So um, after the report was released, um, so before we released it, there was um, some polling done, and it showed that Americans thought that family separation was a bad outcome of immigration policy, but they didn't believe it was actually happening. So it was the kind of thing where, like, if that were happening, that would be bad, but we don't think it's happening. So our report changed the immigration story to make it clear that family separate, not just family separation happens, but like this permanent, legal, s abduct the kids, make them adoptable by other families, uh, that that was happening. And it's, it's obviously an extreme, not all fam immigration related family separation is that extreme, but by looking at the extremes, we helped establish the problem more broadly. Um, and uh, there were a couple of very, straightforward impacts. The state of California passed new laws regulating how child welfare agencies would deal with um, deportations, families where deportations was a factor. Um, President Obama 
talked about the report a week after it came out with in a briefing for Latino journalists and then issued a parental interest directive which told ICE how to deal. And then in the last two years of the Obama administration, deportations went down by half. So our contention was as long as mass deportations continue, you're gonna keep having high numbers of kids of deportees in child welfare. So deportations actually, I mean, they were still too high. It was still mass deportation, but it did go down from like 400 something a year to 200 something a year. And so all of that, we think, reduced the numbers of kids in this situation. Um, and now we think those numbers will go back up. It's inevitable with like the kind of massive deportation program that the Trump administration is talking about. There's no way that that's not going to leave a whole lot, possibly millions, of US-born children um, and, uh, and other children without their parents. Um, the other thing I also want to bring up is in addition to the report and the color lines coverage, in conjunction, um, Race Forward also undertook the Drop the I Word campaign to raise media and public awareness about the harm done by using terms like illegal, illegal alien, et cetera. The campaign was successful in getting several um, news outlets to drop the use of the, these terms in favor of more humane alternatives. Um, can you talk more about the Drop the I Word campaign and how it impacted the Shattered Families report and vice versa? Yeah, it was, um, so we started the Drop the I Word campaign in 2010. We released this report at the end of 2011. So they were about a year apart in the startup. And um, when we started Drop the I Word, <laughs> Um, we were, we took our lessons from other campaigns, the campaign to get news outlets to stop using the word homosexuality, for example, and to use LGBT or gay and lesbian instead. Um, and, uh, the campaign to get news outlets to use Ms. instead of Miss and Mrs. So we learned a lot from other campaigns around language. And um, our contention was that the word illegal is applied to immigrants in a racially discriminatory way. So your Irish undocumented people are never labeled that, nor are your Eastern Europeans or Russians. And I, I live in a um, heavily Eastern European neighborhood, and I know there are tons of undocumented people there because I hear people talking about it, like at the diner and just in the course of daily life. Um, so we said, this is a word that is applied in a discriminatory way. And that means it's not acceptable. If you're gonna apply it with a racial tinge to it, then you can't use it and pretend that it is um, okay. And um, we targeted journalists in particular and especially targeted the Associated Press because, the, because of how influential their style guide is. Uh, so our, our broad goal was to generate a debate in journalism, in the field of journalism, about whether or not it was okay to use that word, and then ultimately drive that debate toward getting the AP to change their style guide, uh, which they did in 2013, um, just before we were about to give up. <laughs> so, I mean, we had run the campaign for three years, nobody gave us a dime to do it. Many people said, like, it was stupid, or you should focus on the policy and the, not the words. Um, but the reason that we felt like the words were as important as the policy is that you could not change the policy as long as people thought, uh, as Americans thought of people with brown skin as illegal. I mean, there was a study done during the course of our campaign by the National Hispanic Media Coalition that showed that one third of Americans thought that all Latinos in the US were undocumented. Everybody, everybody with a Latino last name must be undocumented, they thought. And that's entirely because of the ubiquitous word, use of illegal attached to images of largely Latino men. Um, so that was a situation where we, we kind of just read the timing and we thought 
we we understood that immigrants are mad enough about this and it's also affecting enough non-immigrant people of color we have critical mass we could win this now um and we did and also um i remember one of the things that i was you know surprised by in that was that just as there was this campaign to undo this that there had been a campaign to do this. Yes. And I was like, I did not realize how, that how much work had gone into making those associations through those terminologies and even through images, yeah. you know. And So the thing to know about that is, um, and um, there's a guy named Frank Luntz, uh, who is the Republican communications expert. And he had done a bunch of testing of language around immigration in right after September 11th. And one of the things he found, um, there's a memo, you can read it, it's like all over the internet. He said, actually, post September 11th, Americans are not very concerned about immigration, about undocumented immigration, too much immigration. They're just, they don't worry about immigration. They're cool with it. So if you want to restrict immigration, what you have to do is tie immigrants to terrorism and, to, and um, frame the whole debate around law and order. And so his thing was, uh, call them illegal immigrants. Don't call them illegals because the noun is racist, he said, um, but use illegal immigrant. And then all of the um, immigrant restriction organizations started to push it really hard. So I interviewed a board member of the Center for Immigration Studies in like 2004, and he said to me while I was interviewing him, I insist that you use illegal immigrant and not other euphemisms. And I was like, you can't tell me what to write my own story. Like, I'll quote you saying whatever you say, but no, uh, I'm gonna call people what I wanna call them and what they wanna be called. Um, so there had been, it, it's not like illegal just came to be because it's the, it's the correct word. It's not the correct word. We had lots of lawyers talk about why it's not the correct word, why it's not actually used in immigration courts. Um, and, uh, but there, but it was, uh, I think what this speaks to, and this is like the big point I wanna make, is that you can't just have a political strategy. You have to also have a cultural strategy. And part of that cultural strategy is a narrative strategy. It's about how uh, people of color are characterized, how they are seen, and, um, and what kinds of plots we participate in and how. Are we agents or just victims? Are we heroes or always being saved by someone else? Um, are we um, here because we have um, ambitions and visions for our lives or are we here purely out of desperation? Um, you know, I'm always about giving people of color agency um, in, all of their lives, their cultural lives as well as their political lives. And that's what Race Forward has tried to, that's the niche we've tried to fill in the racial justice movement. Great, um, you can really see how across all of those storytelling and narrative is key, whether it's to the research report and, and whether it's color lines coverage or whether it's the Drop the I Word campaign um, also. Um, so you were starting to talk about this, you know, Shattered Families was published more than five years ago, and it depicted the situation under President Obama, a Democratic president, under whom there were record number of deportations. Fast forward to today, and where we've had a Republican presidential candidate campaign for 18 months about building a wall, spreading hateful and harmful rhetoric about immigrants, and now he has taken office and is officially ramping up brutal detentions and deportations. But he is also uh, noticeably silent as the number of hate crimes against immigrants increases. So um, from where you sit, you know, what do you make of all this and what do you see as the most urgent priorities in addressing the xenophobia against immigrants today? That's all. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How do you stop it? Um, so I think that um, racial prejudice and fear are very easy to gin up. And, um, and that they, they work in service of a lot of things. So they work in service of war, if you wanna make war. 
They work in service of um, getting rid of public programs, safety net programs, if you want to get rid of safety net programs. Um, they work in service of privatizing public education, if you want to do that. And the reason that racism and xenophobia work for those purposes is that they play on, um, uh, th I think they play on the neurology of fear and anxiety. And um, so one of the big developments in racial justice strategy over the last 10 years has been neuroscience. It's all the things we have learned about how the brain works, um, how it reacts to people who are different from me, um, people I perceive to be on the outside. And um, trust me, the restrictionists are way on top of that science, just as we should be. Um, and um, the storytelling, the act of storytelling, the act of story listening is, is, I mean, it's kind of everything. It's like the story triggers all kinds of um, associations in the brain, all kinds of thinking, and then actually triggers behavior and action. And so I think if I've learned anything from this period of working on immigration, being an immigrant, um, coming out of organizing and wanting to make policy change, it's that the story really matters. And there are a lot of different places and ways to tell the story. When you're canvassing um, for an election, you're telling stories every time you knock on a door. And when you're visiting your state legislator, you're telling stories. Even if they say, give me the statistics, what they actually want to hear is the story. Um, and I think in political work, we often over rely on data, you know, um, and we expect the data to do all of the work for us, but actually we have to build a story. Um, my book, The Accidental American is back there. It alternates um, very narrative chapters about Mamdu, who's the immigrant waiter and his experience after 9-11. And in between chapters about him are chapters about the immigration policy debate in DC at the same time. And I know people who read only the policy chapters, which I can't even imagine why you would do that. I'm like, why would you do that? Because everything is about the story. But I think that that is, that is the learning curve of politicos, that they have to learn to read the story chapters, not just the policy chapters, um, if that makes sense. Absolutely makes I'm just sense. Kind of answering random questions. No. Too, so. <laughs> no, that I think I mean we're at the writers' workshop, so story is key. And actually, this is a perfect segue for um, us to segue to Shanti Shankaran's reading. So we'll hop off the stage, yep. and Shanti will hop on the stage. Hi, everyone. Uh, is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah? Great. So thanks for coming out tonight. I'm really happy to see you all here, and I'm fascinated by the discussion that we just heard. Um, so I'm going to read some a, a couple of excerpts from my book, Lucky Boy. And I'm going to read some excerpts that I don't normally read, but they speak sort of to this discussion of families establishing themselves in the US and um, this idea of foster care and how, you know, undocumented parents lose custody of their children through the foster care system. So I have to say, as I was researching this book, I got to a certain point where I had, I was thinking, I have no idea what happens to allow children to go to foster parents and then get adopted away from their undocumented parents. And as I was asking this question, like this report sort of floated to the, to the surface and it was the Shattered Families Report and it, it absolutely saved me and it allowed me to write this book. Um, that was like four years ago, five years ago. So I'm very grateful that Race Forward did that work. 
So we're going to start off with Soli. Soli is a young, undocumented woman from Mexico. And she ends up in Berkeley, California, which is where I live. And she, this is like halfway through the book. She has a child. She has a baby. So we're going to meet Soli and Ignacio, her baby, in the first days of Ignacio's life. That's our first, our first excerpt. A tune, a hum from Soli's lips, each note a pinprick to sensitive ears. She hardly knew she was singing. Ignacio El Viento Castro Valdez. She whispered to the bundle in her arms. I will call you Nacho, and so will your cousins and friends. If only we knew who your father if only we knew your father's family name, you would have that too. She couldn't name him Checo. To Soli, only Checo was Checo. And so, to combat the primal, heart-crunching fear, he would be Ignacio. And El Viento for your father, the wind, she said. Digestively, at least, he was living up to this. So far, like a good son, he had given Soli everything she wanted. For Ignacio to guard her thumb in the curl of his fist, for him to reach for her in that baby way, his hands trembling, as if air and light were his own phantasmic inventions. She wanted him to search the sky for her, to kick his legs and struggle for her breast, as if milk were air and suckling, breathing. All she wanted was that they stay this way for a good while longer. As long as he stayed the same, she could stay the same, wrapped in her room and sheltered from the do this and do that of the world beyond the door. His shit smelled like baking bread. His lips were hardly lips at all. The button of his chin, the porcelain poppy cups of his ears, the sturdy fat of his hands. I will tell you about your father, Ignacio, Soli said, but she fell asleep before she began. She sat propped up in bed with eyes closed and mouth open, cradling him in one arm. She would wake again and continue. I will tell you about your father, the wind. I'll tell it to you now, when you're too young to have to understand. She would speak quietly so as not to inv invite the snatching spirits. How to explain La Bestia? It was a monster train. You don't know what monsters are, but being a child, you soon will. Your father and I rode La Bestia together. He protected me. There were bandits on that train who would throw you off it, send you down to the slicing wheels if you didn't give them all you had. There were hitmen and con men and some downright no-good majaderos. But we won't talk about them. We'll talk about your father, the wind. He was one of the good ones. There were many good ones. Your father said he was going to be a gardener. He could name every tree we passed. He would probably move on, he said, start off with a boss, but build his own business. Chaco had said this only to Soli on one of their few mornings together when they lay wrapped in his sweater in the pre-dawn chill. Around his braying, bragging boys, he kept his mouth shut, pretending along with the rest of them that nothing much mattered. But you want to know who your papi is, Nacho. She paused. Nacho, we don't know. The last time she'd seen Checo was outside a factory in northern Mexico, running for his life, solely exploding inside, more certain with every second that letting him go would be the worst decision she'd ever made. But she'd had no choice. There was no long goodbye, no final kiss. At the edge of the Sonoran Desert, shots rang out. Whether they were bandits or drug traffickers or drug trafficking bandits, she would never know. What she did know was that the whole group ran, Mario, Flaco, Nutsack, and Checo. They scattered in all directions. What she did know was that she was safe, and so was her hidden baby. I made it, she told Nacho. I made you. I didn't know what I was doing when I did it, but it turns out I survived for you. I might tell you all this again someday. I might tell you about your father when you're old enough to know. I may tell you about my voyage some years from now, when you've grown and you've known a little of the bad stuff of life. 
Just when you think you know what's what and can't be touched, I will tell you everything. And when I do, Ignacio El Viento Castro Valdez, you'll know what you are made of. The first month passed in a flash. Soli did not grow bored. She did sit for hours before the television, but spent most of them watching Ignacio work at her breast. When you have just one possession, you guard it with your life. The you that once centered your universe becomes nothing but a keeper of that one precious thing. As the weeks passed and Ignacio proved increasingly that he would live, Soli's fear shifted to the newly formed knowledge that she was now tied more fiercely to fate and luck than she'd ever been before. Having a child was like turning inside out and exposing to the world the soft pulp of her heart. If something happened to Ignacio, if illness took him or an accident, she herself would never recover. If the night stole his breath away, as sometimes happened to the very, very young, her own breath would never return. At night, thoughts like this sat vigil around her bed. She woke every few hours to look at him, lying next to her in a nest of blankets. She felt for his breath, touched a hand to his forehead, and tried to sleep again. But those were the nights. The days were a different story. The days brought her light and comfort and the eager Berkeley spring. And amid the uncertainty of new motherhood, the sleepless fog that hung over her days, Soli felt that she had a home. Motherhood was her dwelling, the boy at her breast, her hearth. After a month of heavy dawns, Soli returned to the Cassidy bungalow, this time with a basket full of boy. So that's a brief introduction to Soli. Um, <clears throat> I'm now going to move on to my other set of characters. This is Kavya and Rishi. They're an Indian-American couple living in Berkeley. Um, they're a bit like me. They're the, the son and daughter of immigrants. Um, they have a fairly comfortable life. They have a very beautiful life, in fact, except they can't have children. That's their, their central struggle. Um, so I won't go into the details, but they end up as foster children, uh, sorry, foster parents to Ignacio. This is when Ignacio is about just over a year old. Um, so we meet, we meet them on the day that Ignacio is due to arrive for the first time at their home. And now, the day of Ignacio's arrival. The sun pounded its welcome through the bedroom window. Kavya stood in the doorway, still hunched with sleep. She wore an old t-shirt of Rishi's with the sleeves cut off, and her arms dangled from them like jungle reeds. Her legs were bare. White panties stretched across her hips. I'm speaking to my mom today. That's nice. I'm speaking to her about Ignacio, she said. Oh. Rishi studied her face. Kavya was right to be worried and Rishi didn't envy her task. Breaking unfavorable news to Uma Mahendra when there was nothing that Uma could do was like swatting a wasp. Uma Mahendra had made her position clear. Offspring sprung off the family tree. Adoption was trouble. Adopted children were shadowy variables in an otherwise finely wrought equation of marital eugenics. Adoption itself subverted what Uma saw as a very purpose of existence, to marry, to mate, to give birth to caste-navigated, elder-sanctioned, blessed and bouncing bundles of reproductive hope. To adopt, to take a child from some other union, some union of whose nature they had barely an inkling, was an act that uprooted the very foundations of family. The phone rang. It's her, said Kavya. I can tell. She did not move and let it ring until Rishi rolled out of bed, crossed the room, and picked it up. Hi, Mom. Sure, we were up. Uh-huh. 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 Kavya snatched the receiver and pressed the speakerphone button. Hi, Emma. What you're doing? 
Her mother sounded suspicious already at eight on a Sunday morning. Rishi stretched, put on a T-shirt, and headed to the kitchen to make their morning tea. From the doorway, he watched his wife. He watched the woman he thought he knew try to reason with her mother. Her skin was still still powdery with sleep. Her voice raspy. As she listened, her jaw sawed to and fro. She picked at the rug and rubbed her eyelids, quiet, listening despite her best intentions. This was not his wife. The wife he knew did not ask for approval. Nor did she weave crisis, drawing it from her palm like spider silk. The Kavya he knew wouldn't be seeking her mother's pardon on a day like today. Her pursuit of it was nothing but self-destructive. But Kavya, this new Kavya, seemed to need it badly. She submitted totally to her mother's rattling tirade. Her body sprawled at angles like a homicide outline. When Uma met the kid, she'd fall in love, as all grandmothers did, or she wouldn't. But there was no reasoning with an angry wasp. He filled the kettle and put it on the stove. When he returned to the bedroom with a mug in each hand, he found Kavya lying flat on the floor, her palm pressed to her forehead, still on the phone. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. When she saw him, she put the phone down, rolled onto her side. And took the mug of tea. Rishi lay facing her on her carpet, listening to Uma squawk through the room. He wondered if she'd always sounded like that, or if her voice had changed with age and wear. Kavya's face was slack with defeat, her cheeks drooping to the floor. Her eyelids fluttered as she listened. It angered him suddenly that this day of all days should have to begin like this. He listened to Uma's litany. It was a thorough one. She remembered it all: the mistakes they made in trying and failing to get pregnant, the recklessness of their decision to foster, the hassles they would inevitably face, the perils that lay with the little boy who, at that very moment, was eating his breakfast, watching his foster mother pack his bag, and preparing for the car ride that would bring him to their door. He hoped that maybe. In her pre-tea state, Kavya was too sleepy to detect the condemnation that saturated the airspace of their bedroom. He wanted this to be a good day for her. He set his mug next to the telephone and pulled her close. He took her mug from her hand and placed it next to his. He pressed the speakerphone button, shrinking Uma's voice to a distant buzz. His fingers moved up Kavya's shirt and found her breasts. She drew closer to him, looped her arm around his neck, and kissed him. And then, they proceeded to do what had come to feel like an exercise in failure. But on this muggy Sunday morning, with their future eating its breakfast, their tea steaming on the carpet, and maternal disapproval still rattling from a nearby mouthpiece, proved to be the, be the essential thing, the only thing. It was nearly ten. A ring of steam misted the window pane where Kavya pressed her forehead. Rishi wanted her to tell her to relax, to come away from the window. One of them had to be calm, but he wasn't calm and couldn't pretend to be. So he pressed his own forehead to the window and gazed out onto Vine. Their French toast grew cold and wet. The air was heavy that morning. The sky bereft of color, waiting for rain to break. Outside his window, the bougainvillea hung lushly off their gate. The grass grew wild, overfed that spring with rain. Rishi thought of trimming it, but couldn't bring himself to leave the window. The time was 9:47. The phone rang. Kavya grabbed it, said three words, put it down. They're almost here. What Kavya and Rishi hoped to project from under the eaves of their Berkeley bungalow. Was an air of parenthood, an air of belonging where they were, of knowing what to do with a little stranger, for that's what he was—a stranger, as foreign to them as they were to him. Parents were people who knew what they wanted. It fell to Rishi and Kavya, the parents in this game of make-believe, to do and say the things that parents were meant to say and do, until pretend became real, and they found one day. If it all went well, that the little boy was theirs and they were his, 
that the three of them did indeed belong to one another. Pretending at this point was the most that they could do. Thank you. We have another round of applause for that great reading. So um, I'll ask Shanti a couple of questions, and then we'll have a broader conversation, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Um, Shanti, your uh, novel, Lucky Boy, focuses on the lives of immigrant families, the hard decisions they make to immigrate, their hopes for their lives in America versus the harsh realities they face here, how the tensions of uh, immigration affect generations differently, um, the longing for their homeland uh, and extended families. Uh, these issues are even more fraught for undocumented families whose lives are constantly in peril from immigration enforcement, predatory employers, and traffickers. Can you talk about the research you did as, as well as any personal experiences that uh, went into shaping your narratives and the, and the characters? I know one of the things that um, led to this program was that our conversation a year ago where you mentioned sh you know, um, Shattered Families, shattered families yeah. and, and, and I was like, wait, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just wanted to you know, hear your reflections on both the kind of um, both the research and the personal excavation that you did? Yeah, so I started off um, initially just hearing about this happening to parents, uh, about parents having to fight for custody of their children who were taken off of them and put in foster care when the parents were put in detention. So I was hearing sort of news reports about, about this topic and as a fiction writer, those, those reports stuck with me, but I wanted to really get inside and, and figure out what was happening like internally for these people. So I really had to start from the outside and work in. I started out just learning you know, what the immigration situation was in the US at the time. Um, I read a lot of oral histories. There's a great collection called Underground America. It's a collection of oral histories from undocumented immigrants. So that was one of the first places that I started and um, I just spoke to anyone who would speak to me really so immigration lawyers um, policy experts um, Seth Fried Wessler the author of Shattered Families it, what was what was his position as a lead author yeah yeah so I found him on Facebook and was like will you talk to me please um, so I just had a lot of people lending their expertise to me and being very generous with their time. And as I researched, I, you know, it's that factual information that really opens the door to understanding the spiritual side, the, the personal side of a situation. Um, but I couldn't have accessed that without really knowing the, the factual framework of what was happening. Yeah. Um, and I also wanted to talk to you about how uh, you portray violence, you know, and the way in which it can invade the lives of, you know, immigrants and the immigration experience. Um, how did you go about fleshing out the perilous experience of crossing the border experienced by Solimar and her beloved Checo, um, as well as her harrowing experience of being held in the shadowy detention system? Mm -hmm. um, there are so there's not a lot known because of how um, closed how, off. Yeah, closed yeah. off it is, and and um, so without knowing about the whereabouts of her son Ignacio and you know how he's doing. So did you get to talk directly to immigrants who had experienced these things uh, themselves? And you know what were you most struck by? I did not get to speak to immigrants who were in detention. Um, I did speak with immigrants who had crossed the border without papers. Um, so I got a sense of what uh, what that was like, what what perils they could face. And I also got a sense of the fact that once they got to the other side of that experience, they felt okay. 
you know, they, they, had, they had overcome that obstacle. They got to the side of their life in America. And once they got to that side, their, their primary focus was just to feel normal, just to feel at home. Um, in terms of portraying the violence that occurs in detention centers, I had to think about incarceration itself. And, you know, it's not always just detention. Sometimes it's the prison system that we can learn from as well. Um, so I had to really dig into my perceptions of what, uh, what, what abuses of power could happen. You know, when, you're, when you put fallible humans in an incarceration situation. Um, and in terms of portraying that violence, I, you know, from a writerly standpoint, I tried to stay just very factual, very physical, letting the actions speak for themselves. Yeah. Um, one of the things I loved about Lucky Boy is that it broke this unwritten rule that you can only focus on one immigrant group. It's as if, you know, publishers are concerned that readers will be confused and their heads will explode um, if you feature two immigrant communities. Um, and yet, that is just not the reality, particularly in cosmopolitan, you know, areas. So you juxtapose the diversity and tensions within immigrant communities and between immigrant communities um, and, and the differences, you know, and the impact of being documented versus undocumented, being highly educated versus, you know, uh, not being well educated, coming from wealth, not coming from wealth, but also more subtler differences like the fact that, um, uh, you know, Soli versus her cousin Sylvia are both undocumented, but Sylvia has been in the U.S. longer, mm -hmm. and so that has different currency and, you know, and she's more established. So. Um, what went into your decision to build a narrative around this juxtaposition of, you know, different immigrant groups and, and <laughs> how hard was it to find a publisher for it? So this is an interesting question. I, um, I started off, you know, just I, I'd never had a, a white character in Kavya's place. I started off with Soli and Kavya. And I chose Kavya to be an Indian American simply because that's what I like writing. You know, that's sort of, I, I, I by default make my characters Indian or Indian American, because why not? You know, that's sort of, that, that's what I find interesting um, or, or, or fun to write as, as a writer. Um, I think it was maybe a couple years in when maybe the book was on its second round of rejections when I half jokingly wrote to my agent, who's here. Um, and kind of only half jokingly said, well, maybe I should change all my Indian characters to white people. Maybe then I'll get published. Um, and she's, she was like, no, no. Uh, and she pointed out to me something that I hadn't thought about, which was this was the story of how um, different ethnicities interact on the American soil and, and what you know, opportunity means differently for, for different groups. So I had primarily been thinking about this as Soli's story, and Kavya was just there by default. Um, so it was when she said that to me that I began thinking more deliberately about the interaction of different types of immigrants. So we have them, and then we have the Cassidys, who are Soli's employers, who are like, you know, fifth generation Irish American, sort of, you know, they've gone back to Ellis Island and found their ancestors and, um, so they're, they're of that stage of American that is trying to reclaim their immigrant roots from, from way back. Um, so I don't know, you know, getting published, that could just be a fault of the book. You know, I worked on the book continually um, because it did eventually get published. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Agent. Um, for championing that. And I, I say that completely seriously yeah. because I, I do think that, you know, I'd love to see more books like this that really reflect, you know, um, the, the world. Um, um, speaking of impact, I'm curious, since your book came out um, and you've been going on tour with it, uh, I'm curious what the reaction has been both from like non-immigrants who, you know, are they like, I never thought about these issues, you know, the issues immigrants face. I now have some appreciation for my neighbor. 
Or, you know, have you heard from immigrants who said thank you for mm -hmm. telling our stories? Yeah. You know, whether it's the, you know, whether it's the Soli story or the Kavya story or... Um, yeah. Um, I have heard, you know, people who are non-immigrants or, or not, you know, recently immigrated. Um, they, yeah, they, they did have sort of an eye-opening experience, you know, not really being aware of what what people go through in detention. But I, I think it's not, I think a lot of people don't know what happens in detention. I didn't really know until I really started researching. Um, and um, what was the other part of the question? Even um, immigrants, you know, oh, right, saying. Right. Yeah, so my, one of my concerns early on was the fact that I was writing the story of an undocumented Mexican woman, you know, being uh, a documented, a, a natively born um, Indian American, writing so far out of my own experience, you know, that, that takes a certain amount of privilege, and, and I was very aware of that, and a little worried about, about, about feedback. Um, so, so far, people have been very gracious and have had a, a good positive reaction to my telling of Soli's story. And I think there's an appreciation that someone outside of the immediate uh, demographic group would care about such a story and, and give life to a story. Um, yeah. It's always interesting to hear like how, you know, you, you spend so much time, you know, in such a solitary way doing this and, you know, when it must be both nerve wracking but also gratifying. Um, so this question is for both of you actually. Um, at the center of the Shattered Families report and of Lucky Boy are the stories of two mothers you know, in, the, in Lucky Boy, it's Kavya and, and Soli who love their child. One's a birth mother, one's a foster adoptive mother. And then there's this question of what is best for the child, you know, um, and there are systems built around trying to answer and, you know, uh, act on this, on this question. And built into that question are issues of family, uh, privilege, citizenship, human rights, um, so I just want one, both of you to talk about from your respective vantage points, uh, since this is so central, you know, beyond the statistics and beyond, you know, it it's comes down to this in some ways. So in the follow-up to the Shattered Families report, we reported, we did about a year and a half of reporting on a particular case, the case of a man named Felipe Montes, who was, um, I have to remind myself of some of the deep details, I think he lived in North Carolina, he had a white American wife, they had had three kids, and he got deported. When he got deported, she um, had some health issues and they eventually made it really hard for her to take care of the kids. So the kids then went into foster care, had foster parents who wanted to adopt them, but Felipe was in Mexico like, I need my kids. Mm -hmm. So a year and a half of our reporting, a bunch of organizing and advocacy later, he, he got a special uh, visa to come back for family court. Because part of the problem is that once parents are deported, they cannot take the steps. They can't show up in family court, they can't take parenting classes, they can't do whatever the child welfare system says you must do to get your kids back. So then they end up losing their kids because they literally cannot get back into the country to do those things. So he was allowed to come back for family court and eventually um, he took the kids with him to Mexico. So um, I remember asking my mom when we were working on this that if something had happened and somehow she and my dad were gonna be deported and my sister and I were gonna be in the States. I asked her, would you have left us in the States with like cousins or something? Or even if things were less awesome in, in India, presumably that's where she would have been deported to, would you have wanted us to be with you? And she said, 
no way would I ever let my kids be taken away from me no matter where I am. And I think, I think that um, we documented lots of cases where, where judges made decisions not to let deportees take the kids with them. The kids are often U.S. citizens, so they can come back when, when they're ready. Um, but they, they, they made that decision on the basis of these really stereotypical ideas about countries of the global south. And so it was like all of Mexico was a violent, like, shit fest, basically. We could not ever send a U.S. citizen child to live in Mexico. That would just be completely wrong. And But it was based on, like, not knowing anything about Mexico, you know, except what you read in the headlines. So I think that, um, I mean, we can't really talk about what happens in your book without spoilers. Um, but I think that once a kid is um, a ways into a, a life, a new life, um, that it's pretty hard to just cut that life off and send the kid um, somewhere else. And I think Felipe Montes and his kids really dealt with that. I mean, it's not like they were rich in North Carolina. They were not. They were a, a working class to poor family. Um, but in Mexico, their situation is even a little bit more desperate. And he's got three kids to raise without any help there. So um, I, I favor... Um, I favor self-determination, so if it's possible, I always think it's important to ask the kids. And I think that um, increasingly, our families are just global. They are. Um, even without a deportation, there are um, cultural challenges. I mean, my family experienced them from us growing up here and being Americans, and my parents not being Americans, really until they were Americans, which was a lot later than um, when it happened for me and my sister. So, you know, as much self-determination for all the parties involved as possible, I think, is the principle. And um, a care, f you know, a caring eye toward the relationships that have been built and that need to be built. It seems to me, my understanding is that the policy around like these family courts is very inconsistent, right? So like the woman that I first heard about, um, she was a Guatemalan woman and she never got her child back. Yeah, that's a yeah. famous case actually. Yeah. And it's one of the rare cases um, um, where the deported parent did not get to keep her child. Um, most cases in which deportees have sued for their children back have ended with the children going back with the... Um, biological parents, but in that case, the court said that she had waited too long. So this is a woman who didn't speak English, was in prison, and then immigrant detention, and then deported. Um, and there's no, it's hard to communicate with anybody. That's like a lot of the factor. You don't get access to your lawyer. You often can't find your the social worker who's got your kids and is handling your kids' cases. And a lot of that had happened in her case so that years went by and by the time she got it I think it went to the Supreme Court this case by the time it went to the last court it had been so long that the court said um, she she waited too long basically sorry I didn't mean to like bogart your answer no no you you've you summarized it well yeah so her son now lives with his adoptive parents and he has a different name and he doesn't speak Spanish anymore and I'm just curious as to what's going to happen when he grows up you know, he, he's going to grow up. He's going to probably figure out that he has a Guatemalan mother um, who he wasn't given access to. And that should be interesting to see how that, how that pans out. How did, how did this, when you read about that case and other cases, like, how did that um, go into shaping the characters of Kavya and Soli? You know, because I think, you know, without giving away you know, the whole plot, the, fundamentally, it, you know that there's this crux and um, you, as a reader, you empathize with both of them, you know, um, because they're coming from a place of being a mother. 
and they um, both believe that they are. So I'm just curious about how, yeah. how you built that into it. Right. So my initial impetus, as I said, was to, to tell something similar to um, the mother's story who lost, her, who lost custody of her child. So my initial sympathies lay with that side of the equation. So I had to be really conscientious and careful about building up the other side because I didn't want this to be a story where, you know, Kavya and Rishi were the bad guys, where they were, um, you know, where they were just steamrolling over solely um, because that would be boring. You know, if I'm going to have two sides, they both need to be compelling and complex. So I had to really start to understand how Kavya could get to a point where she could justify to herself um, adopting or fostering, not, not fostering, but adopting another woman's child. Yeah. Well, the question is the consent of the other woman, right? Right. Like right. if you're adopting, you want the right, biological parents to have consented to yeah. the adoption. Key so point. so it, that's, the, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the part that's missing right. in, de uh, in deportation situations, often, right. often missing. Not always, but right. Often. Um, and that's a, that's you know and and to the extent that you know in shattered families it showed you know whether willingly or inadvertently or b through bureaucratic reasons you know there's a lot of missing missing links. So I want to uh, pan over to um, the audience for questions. Um, but first, I feel given that. Um, everything that's going on in the ether politically and particularly for um, immigrant families, uh, undocumented families, um, I feel like these are stressful times, you know, um, when immigration and immigrants are being viewed as suspect, you know, when families are being torn apart in a country that many times, you know, says that it espouses family values. Uh, I'm not sure what those are, but um, since, you know, from where you sit, Rinku, um, can you share with us one thing that you think that anybody can do to help immigrants and their families? Um, there are a bunch of organizations to whom you can give money um, that is going to get used for deportation defense. And um, so I would look up not one more. Any farm worker organization anywhere in the country could use your donation. Um, they'll definitely be rated. I actually was in a meeting today where um, uh, one of the people in the meeting was Ramon Ramirez, who runs the state farm worker union in Oregon, raid last night um, in his hometown, 18 people arrested, 18 farm workers. In that case, they managed to get 10 of them released. Um, none of them with convictions, you know. So the whole, I mean, one thing to know and to convince other people of is that the administration's contention that we're just um, uh, deporting quote-unquote criminals is simply false. Um, you can, you should just resist that part of their narrative as much as you can. Um, so giving money, I think if you're here in New York, um, there are organizations, people are making family um, emergency plans. If you're willing to be part of somebody's emergency plan, then uh, what you want to do is not put it on Facebook, but go and talk to an immigrant rights organization that you know and say what you're willing to do. Do it in person. Don't call. Um, don't use email. Don't text. <laughs> Um, and from money to shelter, there's lots of, and advocacy, legal services, there's lots to do. And then in the bigger picture, I really think that, um, I think we're in a good position to do this, but I think that the pain of this administration's approach is going to um, spread really fast. And it's not going to be limited to immigrant families. It's going to move, uh, and undocumented people, it's going to be like m m many immigrant families are mixed status, right? There are people with documents, people without. Um, so I think we have to be so prepared to take advantage of the horror that Americans are soon going to feel when, um, you know, 
the military is basically like knocking down the door at their workplaces and raiding restaurants. Um, and and we have to um, we have to present another option to um, limiting immigration. So the um, immigration restrictionists have used everything possible, 9-11, um, ISIS, the uh, migrant children crisis of last year to not just um, deal with people who are undocumented now, but to actually reduce legal immigration. The end game there is no more immigrants. Like there are too many of us brown skinned people. They're, they're done with us. They want to stop us coming. And so that you have to, I think the more you understand that that is the long game and the more you can help other people understand that like today's deportation is not just about today, these 11 million people, it's about the future and who is going to be allowed to enter the United States for whatever set of reasons. And the ultimate goal again is to um, cut off legal immigration um, and there's a little, there's, there's a coming attack on birthright citizenship. I mean, I have been in countries where there is no birthright citizenship. In Italy, in the Accidental American, I report on Mamdu's Italian branch of family, Italy does not have birthright citizenship. So um, Mamdu's family is into the third generation there. They are not citizens, none of them, not one of them. They cannot vote, um, they have limited rights. They are not considered Italians, even though they're not going anywhere else. So those, I think, keeping an eye on the long games of the other of the opposition and helping to inoculate our people against that long game, um, that's that's what's in front of us. Well, that that's really important. I I wanted to send us out into the evening and you know end a day like today, the International Women's Day, with. Um, helpful information that we can kind of all use. Um, I want to open it up to some questions from the audience. So I think, is a mic going to be going around? Yeah? Um, first of all, thank you guys so much. This has been so interesting. Um, given the importance of narrative, as you were saying, can you guys talk a little bit about the Trump administration's idea that they're going to publicize crimes by immigrants and maybe is that okay? Is it propaganda? Could you just talk a little bit about that? Well, this is them using story, right? So they are planting a story of the criminal immigrant, you know, th th and they're doing it not very subtly. I mean, you know, I, but we can't count on the Trump administration for subtlety. Um, so I, I think that story plays a really important role. They have a story, we tell counter narratives. That's why, you know, books like Rinku's and Paola's and mine and every, you know, all, all, of, all of the narratives are out there are so important to present a counter narrative to what is being sort of shoved down our throats. them publishing like doing that voice program we may it's ki it's unconstitutional so we may be able to but um, so my only thing to add on the counter narrative is that the easy thing is to say but we're not all criminals but that counter narrative has deep implications for other criminalized groups um, particularly black Americans and, but not just black Americans, like people suspected of terrorism who look like us, for example. Um, so the counter narrative is trickier than you would imagine because you can't just say we're not criminals. Because if that's our counter narrative, we're um, making, we're, that means somebody is a criminal, and of course we know who that is in this society. So I think the counter narrative has to be we're full human beings. That has been a lot of our work with Drop the I Word, The Accidental American, that the idea is we have to recharacterize 
immigrants as not just being economic players. Because what the US says is come and work for exactly what we want you to do, for the pay we want you to have, and keep everything else. Keep your language, keep your values, keep your family members elsewhere. Just come, give us your labor, your body, and leave when we tell you to leave. And what we have to do, I think, is present, recharacterize immigrants as more than just economic bodies, worker bodies, as people with um, spiritualities and families and um, pain and genius, you know? Um, and that, I think, will be most effective counter-narrative also. Like, I don't think the we're not criminals thing actually works that well. Because every time you say it, you actually reinforce, you say the word criminal again, which associates criminal with you. Um, so I just think that's like bad strategy and also morally <laughs> repugnant. So better to sort of think about what are the ways we can present immigrants as their whole selves. Hi, I just, my name's Khalil. I'd just like to thank uh, both of you guys uh, for this program. Um, I was actually hoping I could ask you something about narratives, um, specifically how in both of your works, you actually explore the narratives of people who you don't necessarily share an identity with uh, in terms of ethnic, you know, ethnically or uh, religiously. And I actually wanted to know as someone who was interested in you know, looking into narratives different than one's own, um, how did you do it without being like kitschy? How did you do it without being offensive or patronizing? Like, how did you get as close to the truth or to like the heart of the truth as you could be? Uh, sorry if it's a little, you know, a blase question. Yeah, so I had to do this with Soli. And as a writer, the first thing I did was to try to write her in the first person rather than the third. She's, she's ended up in the third in the final, the final draft. And um, so I, I removed that barrier between me and her to start off with. And then, you know, I did a ton of research, but really the most important step that I took was to find my points of connection with her. So yes, she's Mexican, she's undocumented, but really what, what she was to me primarily was a mother and a young woman and a woman who wants something more for herself, something more out of the life that, that she was given. And so those points of connection were really what I dove into and told the story of. And the, the factual elements of her being undocumented and being from Mexico, those filled in and informed what she went through. But really it was that human connection that I focused on. Um, I don't have a lot to add to that. I think the key thing for me, and I write mostly nonfiction, really all nonfiction, um, but the key standard for me is would this person recognize himself when he reads this? Um, or would the person in the situation recognize herself or themselves um, were they to read it or watch it on a screen? And I often, um, I'll show my writing to people. So, you know, The Accidental American is about mom do, but I talked to a whole bunch of other Moroccan immigrants and like showed them the writing and said, you know, just to ask them what they thought and talk to people in Morocco. So, you know, that's a level of vulnerability. You have to like be willing to show people your writing and receive their feedback on, on a very um, touchy, like the, the thing about, can I with my identity write a, write a character with another identity? That is a emotionally fraught question, emotionally, politically, economically fraught question in publishing and in um, culture making. So, um, and in the Accidental American also, we split the money. So uh, actually, you know, we shared, we shared the byline sort of, it's Rinku Sen with Mamdu, um, and we split the money. So that also helps, I think, it helped me feel like I'm not, um, taking someone else's story and they won't get anything out of it. Um, he gets like whatever his hundred bucks a year out of it or, <laughs> you know, the tiny little royalty check that uh, we get.
Right. I'll just add one other point is that, yes, I mean, definitely running it by people from the community that you're writing it um, about um, is, is important. Um, but also, I mean, it, it's starting to become more formalized, you know, like there are these sensitivity readers. And so the idea that, um, you know, that you, that if you have sensitivity readers who are writers from, you know, from a specific background um, and from marginalized populations, th that they, that you pay them for that, you know, effort and that task. So just as Rinku is talking about that it's, it's not necessarily their job or, you know, for them to do out of charity, but it can be, uh, it should be a formal part of the, the writing and research process. Other questions? There was one more back there. Yeah. Hello? Oh, it works. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> Too much power. <laughs> um, oh I don't know what to do with it. Um, is it... Uh, I, um, I guess I want it, to. It's not so much a question, but I want to know what your reaction to this claim or idea is. Um, that uh, immigrants that came here are making too much money. We're getting really wealthy. We're buying up a lot of the housing, and they're threatened by that. And now they're trying to suppress us. Um, they are trying to. Uh, raise the white majority by suppressing the black and brown minority in this country. Uh, that's something that I heard. Um, I agree with it emotionally, um, but I wanted to know if in your research you saw any like factual like basis for that. Thanks. Well, I think the thing about they're trying to raise the white majority and suppress the black and brown minorities that immigrants are doing that, that's that's the idea, right? So I, th I think that um, that comes Oh, I got you. So the restrictionists are trying to, uh, like what are they trying to do? What's their real motivation? Do they want America as a white country and not black and brown? Because we're going to be black and brown. Um, given immigration, and also very short is my um, contention. Like, Americans are gonna get shorter for two generations, and then with all the milk and hormones, um, the, our kids will be super tall, uh, like their white counterparts are. Um, this is me biologizing everything. So, um, I think there is some truth to the notion that when people immigrate to the United States, they, part of the deal, unspoken deal, is you buy in to the racial hierarchy and the racial dynamic that has already been established. And um, much of the work that my immigrant friends do is, um, like Deepa Iyer, who has spoken in this space, talks about that as a racial bribe and talks, um, uh, talks about the need of South Asian immigrants to resist it, like not to take the bribe, to not to buy into the hierarchy, and to resist. So I think there's there's something to that, um, but I don't think it's inevitable, and I don't think it's unchangeable. And I think that many immigrants come and um, both, I mean, first of all, we know colonialism, I mean, that is a racialized structure, a racist structure, colonialism. Um, there's an article I wrote some time ago called, um, you could Google it, called Are Immigrants and Refugees People of Color? That was the title. Because I was speaking to a group of like brown and black immigrants who are like, race has nothing to do with us because at home, we don't have races. And I'm like, did you have colonialism? Because that's about races. Um, so making those connections, I think, is what the standard nation of immigrants narrative does not do, and it's on us to do that. Um, and there are lots of resources. I mean, even my mom, my 73-year-old Indian immigrant, not radical mother, is like, Look at that, you know, the Hindu fundamentalists are big Trump fans. They did events for him, and they're like Hindus for Trump. And she's like, 
isn't that disgusting, <laughs> the Hindus for Trump. So even my mother, who's not particularly political and who always told me, like, you talk about race too much, even she now is um, so awakened by the country's situation um, that she's like fighting with all her 70 year old other Indian immigrant women friends. Um, so it's not inevitable and people can adopt a um, racial justice view of the country and like fit themselves into it, but they have to be organized into that. It's, it's not just gonna happen because they arrive. You're saying is that everybody should organize their parents. It's, it's if you work on them long enough, trust me, things, they might surprise you 40 years later. Any other questions? One back there, all the way in the back. Yeah, um, I, I wish I had a more like even semi-conservative family um, members. Like I have a lot of family who thinks that because we came in legally, um, the illegal Indians who are here kind of deserve what's going to happen. Um, and I'm sure they feel the same way about um, you know, all the Mexicans and every other ethnicity under the sun, although, you know, white never comes into the conversation, um, although there are tons of, like, white European people who are here, um, undocumented. Um, but, but my question is more about, um, you know, with the expansion of the detention centers that is going to be happening, and I just kind of briefly, very briefly glossed over some uh, Washington Post article about the fact that um, in one detention facility they were using the labor of, uh, of immigrants in those facilities and not even paying them and uh, or maybe paying them very minimally but but how like it's it's like the return to a slave you know system and so I'm just really concerned about um, that you know like th that's what's going to be happening and we're you know, just we're in this situation where um, I guess we think that these detention cel centers will be very temporary holding centers. But, you know, based on your story of like this woman who was in prison for and served her sentence, you know, did her time and then still was deported. I mean, this is like a great way for especially the corporatization of America under Trump that's happening. I mean, what could be better? Like here's free labor and they're all brown people and it's like this is exactly what white America really, really wants, you know? Um, brown people who are working basically for free for them. Yeah, um, so this idea of, of one of the earlier comments that you made, this idea of you know, certain Indians or South Asians being undocumented and, and therefore deserving, or, or any immigrant deserving, you know, poor treatment and, and exploitation because they're here um, without papers. I mean, this is something that's very easy for people to buy into. It's sort of a, an easy fix, right? It's an easy mental fix. And I think that there's a real people have to sort of get over this hurdle when they decide to care about something. You know, it's so, it, it really takes a lot to care about something. Um, and you have to sort of make a personal commitment to think about it and feel for it and, and want to do something about it. Not even do something about it, but want to do something about it. That requires labor of people. And it, um, it can be very easy to, uh, as, as I'm sure you know, to, to find those easy off switches for ourselves. Yeah, uh, so just one tiny correction is, this isn't actually the revival of slavery, it's the extension of it to immigrants, because prison labor has been used in that way for a long time, um, but largely black and um, native born people of color. Um, getting paid way, you know, a dollar an hour um, to make jeans and um, make other consumer goods. Um, so it's, it's 
so all of incarceration and detention is it in the end is going to come down to corruption and money so it's really about two or three major corporations that are security corporations they are global they are making money hand over fist on this and i think that that I think our strategy has to personalize that issue. Like we need to go after shareholders, CEOs, investors in those companies. We need to make it, and there is movement like that. There's divestment happening from like prison corporations. Um, those kind of divestment campaigns are good. And in, uh, what is true about what you said is that um, the support for uh, like your everyday run-of-the-mill racist incarceration is shrinking in this country, so they need a new kind, and immigrant detention is gonna be it. So um, that, and then what I'd say about our family members is, I mean, the one useful thing I have to offer is, um, I think when we know facts and we are committed to an issue, it's very tempting when we're confronted with like these regressive ideas, people with regressive ideas, to throw a bunch of statistics at them. That is not gonna work. So, um, and this is where the neuroscience comes in. We know that when the human brain has a frame, a dominant frame, as in, um, they should just do it legally. That's a frame. The notion that there's enough legal immigration available for everybody who needs and wants to immigrate and, um, you know, good for the country, uh, that is a frame. So if somebody has a dominant frame in their heads and you give them facts, the brain is going to protect itself by throwing away your facts. So um, the way to engage the brain is through story. So it means actually, for example, with my mom, um, she's had so much engagement with my friends, including people who are undocumented, people who are black and grew up really poor, people who have been incarcerated. And those interactions um, are, and the stories I tell her, not the data, because I don't actually ever bring her any data. It's those stories that have over time um, started to dislodge her, oh, they should all just get line frame on immigration and other frames on other things. Um, I'll just tell you the other day, she was complaining to me about one of her friends who she says is inadequately engaged in the world. Like today, fascism's coming. You've got to like, everybody's got to get on the program. And she told me, um, my auntie, she said, she said to me, the other day, she asked me, what is LGBT? And Ma was like horrified that her friend did not know what LGBT meant. She was like, does she ever read a newspaper? What the hell? Um, and this just would not have been, I mean, 10 years ago, she would have been like, what is the, what is the T at least? At least she would have been asking about the T. Um, and it's because I like bring her to everything. We have a conference every other year. I'm like, you must come. And, um, and so she gets to have experiences. I think that's what changes people. It's great. I, I can't wait. Then your next book should be The Radicalization of Mama Shen. It really might be. <laughs> um, well, I think that uh, we're probably going to wrap now because it's uh, just after 9. But I want to thank Rinku and Shanti for this incredible rich um, discussion about um, issues. I think going back to Rinku's point, um, talking to each other and talking to, you know, just widening the circle is is going to be key to um, staying sane and, and, you know, getting through, um, you know, because I think silence and darkness is the worst. I mean, to the extent that we can shine a light, the amount of things that actually get done, you know, in the dark and quietly is pretty formidable and you know it's uh not just what's being tweeted about it's a lot of what's happening outside of that so you know just we all urge you to stay vigilant and stay active and involved and ask questions um and read books books uh fiction books non-fiction books uh books particularly by the point of view that you are not seeing out in the world and represented and you know and if things don't make sense you know go investigate 
Um, so thank you both. And both of their books are out in the back. Um, I promise you, you won't regret reading them and you'll walk away amazed. And you can hand it to that friend who you're sick of giving facts to and say, read these beautiful stories. And you can skip the policy parts and just read the stories. No, read all of it. Um, so thank you to all of you for coming out tonight. And what a way to end International Women's Day. We're sorry we couldn't have Paula with us. But I, I'm really thankful to Rinku and Shanti and to the Asian American Writers Workshop for hosting this great discussion. So thank you so much. Thank you.